All right. Well, yes. Uh, great. Thanks, Duncan. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's uh, an honor to speak here in your seminar. And um, yes, before I start, let me just also, yeah, uh, emphasize what, what Duncan said. Uh, the more of you turn your video on, the less uh, alone I feel here in the world. That's, uh, that's nice. Also, um, please uh, ask questions. Um, it's, it's great, the more questions there are. Um, and you can also write the questions in the chat if you, if you prefer. Um, I'm looking at the chat so I can, I can then answer. Um, all right, I think that's the technicalities. So I'm going to talk to you, um, you about squeeze, squeeze knots and that's a joint work in progress with uh, Peter and Andrew. So our plan was to meet this summer and uh, stay together for, for two weeks and write this down. And well, you can guess what happened to those plans. So it might stay a work in progress for just a little bit longer. Um, okay, so this is a story that takes place in the concordance world. So um, let me start by making some definitions. Um, uh, cobordism, uh, sigma, and I write it like this, like a function um, between knots uh, k0 and k1 in S3. This is a compact uh, oriented surface that sits uh, properly and smoothly, um, smoothly and properly in an S3 cross zero one and bounding one knot on the one end and uh, the other one not on the, uh, on the other end. All right. Okay, so everything is going to be smooth. Um, and this gives us a, a notion of distance on the um, set of isotopy classes of knots and I write this just as d. Distance between two knots uh, k and j is just uh, the minimum genus of a cobordism from uh, k to j. Um, all right, let me try to be a bit fancy here and color all the definitions. All right, and well, as I, I guess most of us are aware, this is not uh, really a metric because uh, there are knots that have distance zero. In particular, they're not uh, that have distance zero from the unknot. And uh, let me write G4, the slice genus uh, for the distance um, between a knot and the unknot. And then um, when we uh, quotient out slice knots, we get an abelian group uh, called the concordance group. So that's kind of the setup in which we are going to work. So this is not modulo knots with g4 equal to zero. And um, this is a metric group then uh, with, a, with d as a metric. Okay, just one small remark. Note that uh, the distance of k and j is equal to g4 of um, k minus j. So we can completely understand the distance via this uh, four genus. All right, and now um, let's think how torus knots and uh, later um, other positive and quasi-positive knots uh, fit into this into this group. Um, so, all right, the PQ torus knot, uh, I'll write it as TPQ. This is, uh, well, it's uh, not in the standard torus that represents the homology class PQ, but let me define it via in a braid. So it's the closure of uh, the braid sigma one, sigma two, and so on, until sigma P minus one um, to the power Q. Um, so this is a 
This is a braid in um, Artin's braid group uh, on P strands. And uh, all right, let me make a little example. For example, T34 uh, would be, so this is sigma one, sigma two, and then I compose that uh, four times. Okay, so this is the braid T34 in B3. And then when I close this up, I get the three, four torus knot. So to actually have a knot, I need a P and Q to be co-prime, otherwise I will get a link. Okay, and so all I'm going to say today um, heavily relies on this famous theorem of uh, Kronheimer Morta. Um, 93, I think, uh, which says that um, the slice genus of the PQ torus knot is uh, equal to P minus one times Q minus one half. And uh, while this is interesting because this is also equal to um, the classical three dimensional genus, um, so the maximal. Um, the minimal, that's the minimal genus of a Zeifel surface of that knot. That's not going to play a big role in this talk, but just to say it's, um, you cannot actually do better in four dimensions than, uh, than in three for torus knots. Okay. And then it was remarked by, uh, by Rudolf that knowing the slice genus for torus knots already immediately gives you the slice genus of quasi-positive knots too. And here's what a quasi-positive knot is. So K is uh, called quasi-positive if it is the closure of a braid. That's okay. So uh, when you think, when you hear positive, you could think you just take a product of uh, positive powers of the generators. That would give you a positive braid. For a quasi-positive braid, you allow, you allow um, arbitrary conjugates of the positive generators. So I take a closure of a braid that's a product, let's say from um, of n factors, and each factor is a conjugate of some positive um, generator of, of Artin's braid group. So Wi here is any um, braid, and uh, well, ij is between one and k. Right. Lots of definitions here. Okay, and then um, Rudolf noted immediately after um, the result of Kronhan and Morovka that this um, also implies that uh, for k quasi-positive knot, I'll abbreviate that's a QPOS. And um, as above, we have um, G4 of K equal to one plus N minus K um, half. Which if you look at the, uh, at the braid I gave for the torus knot is uh, just a, um, a generalization of the kronheimer morovka theorem. Okay, and because this already uh, gives a bit of an idea of uh, squeezedness, um, I will I will prove this. I will show how um, how Rudolf proved this. So um, you um, well, you have to show two things. You have to show the ball and the two inequalities. All right, so let's, uh, let's take our knot K here and uh, let's construct a cobordism to the unknot um, that has the right genus. So that's not so hard. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll draw cobordisms in blue. Uh, let's call this uh, sigma minus and um, to construct uh, sigma minus, I just resolve all these um, positive 
generators sigma ij. I can uh, resolve that uh, with, uh, um, with a cobordism of uh, order characteristic uh, minus one. So um, when I resolve all of them, so resolve the um, sigma ij, then I have accumulated an euler characteristic of, uh, of minus n, and I'm left with k disks. And if I want to go to the anode, I cap off k minus one of these disks. Each capping off gives me euler characteristic one. And if I add all this up, and then use uh, that the genus is minus the euler characteristic half, I get an, a genus, well, of one plus n minus k half here, exactly uh, what I wanted. Um, all right, so um, cap of k minus one circles. And okay, let me move this a bit. This gives me um, genus is one plus n minus k half. All right, um, so that shows uh, the one inequality that um, G4 of a quasi positive knot is at most that. And now to show that it is at least that, um, I will go, I will construct a cobordism that, so to speak, goes in the other direction. It makes the knot more complicated instead of less complicated. And um, this one is uh, actually a very uh, simple idea. I will just um, look at my braid. I will resolve all negative crossings, resolve um, all negative crossings. Um, hey, Lucas, can yes. you maybe say again what uh, resolving the crossing means? Um, yes. And also the second question, so I thought these uh, quasi-positive knots have these very specific Seifert surfaces where you like stack these vertical disks and then you have these mm -hmm. positive bands. Is this right. cobalt, isn't just this Seifert surface pushed in? Um, Okay, uh, um, yeah, very good questions. Uh, let me answer both of them. So resolving a crossing means the following. Resolving a crossing means, okay, um, if you look at the, um, at the braid here, um, how do crossings look like uh, with orientation? The orientations are like this. All the strands are, are pointing towards the right. So, um, a crossing in the braid looks like this. Well, that would be a positive crossing. And resolving means I apply uh, I apply a small saddle here, which gives me this. Uh, wait, <laughs> not there. Uh, here, uh, which gives me this. And then I uh, undo this crossing with the Rider Master One move. And you see, I, I get here. And well, that's a single saddle move, a single uh, one handle, so that has uh, all a characteristic one. So that's what I call resolving a crossing. Um, regarding your second question, um, strongly quasi positive knots, um, which are a bit more restrictive than quasi-positive knots, have these uh, special Seifert surfaces that you, that you mentioned. So um, I thought about talking them in the talk, uh, today, but um, left them out because, well, there are so many notions of positivity, I uh, could otherwise spend all my time on them. So, uh, but since you asked, so for a strongly quasi-positive uh, uh, not you don't allow uh, any word as a as a contribute here, but only certain words in such a way that you um, get a canonical uh, Seifert surface. And yes, that surface is exactly um, corresponding to the surface we constructed here, um, pushed into uh, into the forball in the case of a strongly quasi-positive knot. But for quasi-positive knots in general, there is no a canonical Seifert surface, so you can't say anything. Okay, yeah, thanks, I was mixing this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's uh, easily done. Um, more questions at this point? All right, then let me tell you how we discuss, uh, how we um, construct this other cobordism uh, sigma plus. So now we also know what resolving a crossing means. So um, I just resolve all negative crossings 
uh, in uh, my uh, my braid, and then all the positive crossings um, I do the opposite, so I can uh, create crossings instead of resolving them. And uh, all right, let me move this down. So I resolve all negative crossings, and I replace um, all positive crossings by uh, sigma one uh, until uh, sigma k minus one. So you see a positive crossing is, is one of those sigma i, and I just create the k minus two other um, uh, generators in this order. And um, well, where does this lead us? Um, it leads us to, um, to a power of this word of uh, the braid sigma one, to sigma k minus one, so it leads us to a torus, um, to a torus link. And uh, to which one? Let's see. So it will be k, and then, um, all right. Let Let us quickly do the uh, computation. Actually, so let me, um, to to be able to do that, let me say that a is the sum of the lengths of the words w i with which I conjugate. So then there are how many positive crossings? Well, there are a plus n many positive crossings. And each positive crossing will give me one of those words, sigma 1 to sigma k minus 1. So here I will get the torus uh, link uh, k um, n plus a. All right, I noticed that k might have not been the best letter here. So this is a small k, um, which indicates the number of strands in my quasi-positive braid. Okay, and what uh, what genus does this uh, cobordism have? So um, resolving all the negative crossings, how many negative crossings are there? Are there? Well, there are also A, so that costs um, Euler characteristic uh, A. And uh, then creating these um, Uh, Euler characteristic minus a, and then creating these positive crossings, how many do I have to create? Well, n plus a times k minus 2. So I get this n plus n uh, plus a times k minus 2, and then half. So this is the genus, and I'm quietly ignoring here that this is, let's just assume for simplicity that this is actually a knot, so that k and n plus a happen to be co-prime. If they don't, you can just go a little further, but um, I don't want to introduce another variable. So let's just cheat a bit and assume that this is a knot. Okay. And um, all right, now what does this, uh, what purpose does this serve? Well, um, if you uh, consider the composition of sigma plus and sigma minus, um, you get a cobordism from this torus knot to the unknot, whose genus is thus the sum of the genera. And then if you, uh, well, if you add these two things up and you um, do a little calculation, you see that this is actually equal to k minus one times n plus a minus one half. And we know by Kronheim and Rothbard's theorem that this is actually optimal. So there can't be a cobordism with, uh, with uh, less, lesser genus. And that, that means that this cobordism must also be of optimal genus. Because if I had one of, of uh, uh, lower genus, I could still compose it with sigma plus, and then I would get a um, cobordism from this torus knot to the unknot that has the, the genus less than this. But, you know, Kronheim and Rothbard tells us that can't happen. Okay, so that was... Um, something uh, Rudolf remarked, that uh, Kronheim and Rothbard's theorem actually gives us the slice genus for, um, for all quasi-positive knots. All right, and um, a corollary of that, corollary of the corollary is that, uh, oops, the distance um, between a positive uh, torus knot and a negative torus knot is just equal um, to the sum of their slice genera. Because 
um, as I wrote here, the distance between uh, PQ and minus T and S is just the four genus of P TPQ minus minus TRS, which is the sum of two torus knots, which as you can figure out is a quasi positive knot. And uh, we know the size genus of um, quasi positive knots. And so we get this. And all right. What does that tell you? That tells you if you're looking for a cobordism of minimal genus between a positive torus knot and a negative torus knot, then you can just go through the unknot. You can just take a minimal genus of the positive torus knot to the unknot and then from the unknot to the negative torus knot. And the composition of these two cobordisms will be a cobordism of minimal, minimal genus between the positive and the negative torus knot. So that means that in this metric group, in the concordance group, somehow the positive and the negative knots are quite far apart. And the unknot is in the middle. You can't go faster from the positives to the negatives than via the unknot. And now the motivating question is here, are there other knots through which you can go? So we go from a positive torus knot to a negative torus knot let's say along a geodesic, if, if you want to call it that. And the unknot can be on that geodesic, but what other knots can be on that geodesic? And all right, so this is the main definition. A knot K in S3 is called squeezed. If, um, all right, if there is a positive torus knot, um, let's just call it a P, and a negative torus knot N, and uh, furthermore, cobordisms uh, sigma plus uh, from P to K, and sigma minus uh, from K to N, such that, um, the sum of the genera of sigma plus and sigma minus. So the sum of their uh, composition is just the distance of uh, P and N, um, which as you, as you recall from above is just equal to the sum of the um, slice genera of, uh, of P and N. Okay. So, I mean, schematically, it's, um, let's say you have the knot um, P here, the positive the torus knot, and then you have the knot K down here and the knot N here. And then between them, you have, uh, you have these cobordisms. And you see K squeezed between like a sandwich, um, like the middle of a sandwich or a burger between uh, P and N. All right. Um, okay, and this is sigma plus, and this is sigma minus. Um, and okay, so now the rest of the talk is basically two parts. <laughs> One part is which knots are squeezed. The other part is which knots are not squeezed. And uh, along the way, I hope you will uh, see a bit why this is an interesting definition. Okay, uh, let, let's start by, by with some uh, collecting some knots that are squeezed. Well, as soon as my pencil, uh, oh, as soon as my pencil uh, cooperates again with me, but it has no, it has no battery anymore, so this might be all right. Um, all right, so from what we've seen so far, it's clear that quasi-positive and then by symmetry also quasi-negative knots are squeezed. Um, quasi-positive and quasi-negative knots are squeezed. And well, here's the squeezing, right? This is precisely a squeezing. I, I even already wrote sigma plus and sigma minus, and this is squeezing because the unknot is a negative torus knot. Okay. 
And um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload uh, this page to um, the Dropbox and I'm going to open a new page and you can, if you want to look back to the definition, uh, you can have that on the on the Dropbox. Maybe one of the organizers can, can paste the link uh, again put in the chat. For those that uh, haven't seen it yet, that would be great. Um, all right. Yes, thanks, Duncan. Are there uh, are there any questions at this point? Okay. Let's see. Um, all right. Um, and here's an example. of a knot that's squeezed um, that might surprise you. The figure eight knot uh, is squeezed. And uh, well, this is not a quasi positive or quasi negative knot. And um, well, it will follow from a later theorem that it is squeezed, but uh, let me do the squeezing now very explicitly. So here is um, the figure eight knot. And now let us construct um, a cobordism to the positive trefoil. It's the positive trefoil, which is uh, the T23 torus knot. And what we're going to do is, uh, all right, this is a cobordism. And I'll draw a little movie for that cobordism. So uh, let's see, the movie starts with uh, the figure eight knot. Mm, there we go. Let's make it blue. Okay, and then, um, I do a saddle move here. Okay, now you see I have two um, positions where I can do a Reitermeister, a Reitermeister move one, and I actually do that twice. So I change the, uh, the sign of those crossings. Uh, so I get this. Right, I can do that, that's just an isotopy. And then I do the same saddle move again. So I have, uh, in, in summary, I have changed the sign of those two uh, crossings on the left. And uh, this is a slightly uh, non-standard diagram of the positive trefoil. And, um, it took me two cell moves to get there. So this is a genus one cobordism. And now I can do the, I mean, you have the symmetry in the figure eight knot and I can do the symmetric uh, cobordism where I change to other crossings and that will be an, a cobordism with a negative trough on. And minus two, T two, three. So this will be um, analogous cobordism, also of genus one. And you see that the composition is a cobordism of genus two between the positive and the negative trefoil. Each of, each of those has genus one, and by Kronomanrovka also slice genus one. Well, we knew that before, but still. Um, so their distance, their cobordism distance is two. This is an optimal uh, meaning genus minimal cobordism, and the figure eight knot is a slice of that. Um, we could have gone via the anod with a different cobordism, but we didn't. We went via the, the figure eight knot, so the figure eight knot is squeezed. All right. Okay. 
Um, and uh, before we saw and before we see some more notes, let us please let me um, make a remark. We can uh, we can modify our definition a bit. So right now we are squeezing between positive and negative porous knots, but it turns out we can equivalently squeeze between quasi-positive knots and quasi-negative knots. So uh, what I mean is, if we have a quasi-positive knot um, p prime and a quasi-negative knot n prime um, and cobordisms, uh, let's call them uh, t now between um, p prime and k, uh, let's say t plus between p prime and k and t minus between uh, n prime between k and n prime um, such that their composition is uh, of a minimal genus so with uh, gt plus plus gt minus equal to uh, the distance of p prime and n prime so we've now squeezed the um, knot in question the knot k between a quasi positive and a quasi negative knot and then uh, it's also squeezed in our previous um, uh, by our previous uh, definition of squeezedness. So I guess that makes the term squeezedness a bit more natural. You can use torus knots. Incidentally, you can also use strongly quasi-positive and strongly quasi-negative positive uh, knots or positive and negative knots. And that's something I wrote in my abstract and then I decided against doing it in the talk like that. All right, and the proof isn't hard. We've basically already done the hard work. Um, so just by Rudolph's um, corollary, we can take um, a cobordism, uh, I'll call it U plus now, um, from uh, P to P prime, where P is some, uh, some torus knot, where P is a positive torus knot. Uh, such that um, the slice genus of that torus knot is equal to um, the slice genus of p prime and um, the genus of u plus. That's exactly what we constructed in the proof of that corollary. And uh, similarly, uh, we can define u minus and then we just you know we start with a small hamburger and then we just add another slice on top and on the bottom to get a more uh, delicious torus burger instead of a quasi positive burger quasi burger whatever so um schematically what we have is then um this um, just have a stack of these uh, five knots And uh, all right, this is U plus, uh, this is T plus, and their composition is sigma plus. And this is T minus and U minus, and their composition is sigma minus. And now um, P and N squeeze K in the old sense with uh, sigma plus and sigma minus. All right. And well, the advantage of squeezing between um, quasi-positive and quasi-negative knots is that they are they form a, a, a subgroup in the concordance group um, or a submonoid in the in the monoid of isotopy classes. And now, if I have the sum of two squeezed knots, I can also just sum the bottom and the top, and the top and the bottom part, and the cobordisms between them, and um, I get that that is a squeezing of the sum. So what I get now is that uh, squeeze knots um, are a subgroup of the concordance group. For that, you also need that uh, squeeze net is squeeze net squeeze squeezedness is preserved under concordance. But uh, that is also quite clear because. Well, concordance is just a genus zero cobordism, and you can just also put that in the burger, and you don't change the optimality. Okay. 
All right. Uh, any questions? All right. So, um, here comes a big class of knots that's uh, uh, squeezed, or, well, you could argue that it's actually not such a big class, but it's a well-known class, at least all alternating knots are squeezed. And we already saw the example of the figure eight knot, um, but actually you can do something similar for, um, for all knots. Okay, and I wanted to include a sketch, but I've already used quite a lot of time. So I think I'll, I'll skip that um, and I won't show you how to prove this. Uh, maybe I'll just wave my hands for some second and, and mumble some words. So what's special about alternating knots is that, um, well, they have diagrams that they're alternating and alternating diagrams have the property that some of the positive and the negative crossings are well separated. So by that I mean that, uh, for example, if you have parallel crossings, crossings between the same Seifert circles, um, always have the same sign. And the idea here is that you can, uh, well, because these positive and negative crossings are in a, well, in a way well separated, you can use one cobordism to kill all the negative crossings and go to something positive and another to kill all the positive crossings go to something negative. And um, because the positive and negative crossings are well separated, you can do this efficiently enough that it's actually optimal. Um, yes, if you want to know more about this, then well, you can, uh, you can ask me. But um, all right, so let me summarize what we know so far. Um, Squeeze knots are, are a subgroup of the uh, concordance group that contain all quasi positive and negative knots and alternating knots. So, this is, um, well, it's quite a lot already. So, let's go to the second part of my talk um, obstructing squeezedness. How do you show that something is not squeezed? And it looks like the perfect tool to do that. Um, or actually all the tools we know that can do that, they all come from link homologies. Kovanov homology, higat fleur homology, SLN homologies. So this is an application of, uh, of those link homologies. And at the moment, it looks like you can only get it with uh, tools from that link homology. Um, all right, um, let me uh, give you uh, an example of an obstruction coming from this link homology. So um, a slice torus invariant, uh, and I'm quite happy that earlier I saw, oh yeah, Chuck, uh, Chuck Livingston is in the audience. I think he started looking at those and that's great. So this is um, a homomorphism, um, let's call it Y, from the concordance group um, to the reals. Uh, with two properties, it gives a lower bound to the slice genus. And this lower bound um, gives you the slice genus of torus knots. So for torus knots, it's uh, equal. So that's what I call um, a slice torus invariant. And then we have the theorem that uh, if you have a squeezed knot, so let's say we have a squeezing of a knot K. So this is a squeezing. of k, uh, then for all slice torus invariants, y of k 
is just equal to G4 of the positive torus not P minus G sigma plus, which by definition of, of the squeezing is equal to minus G4 of N um, plus G of sigma minus uh, for all slice torus invariance Y. And uh, once more, I'm not going to show this and just uh, again mumble a bit some words. So um, yeah, this is actually not so hard to prove. Um, you use that the slice torus invariant is a lower bound for the slice genius. That means that it also gives you lower bounds on the distance d. And then you just apply these lower bounds to the squeezing. And because you know the slice torus invariant for P and for N, because it's determined there, and because the cobordisms of minimal genus, there's only one possible value for the knot in between. The nice thing is, of course, that as a consequence, if you have a knot, and two different size torus invariants, which disagree on that knot, then that knot is not squeezed. So if y and y prime are a slice torus and uh, yk is different from y prime k, then k is not squeezed. So maybe I should give you some examples. Um, for slice torus invariants. There are not that many of them around. So there is um, the tau invariant from, from higat fluor homology. And then um, roughly around the same time, uh, the S invariant, Rasmussen's invariant from Kovanov homology. You can also take that for different fields. You might get different invariants. And then we have um, the SN invariant. We get some um, generalized Rasmus invariants from SLN, kovanov rozhansky homologies. And actually, that's a whole, uh, there's actually an infinity of them even for fixed M. So we get a big family. And those are basically the slice torus invariants we know. And well, for example, for the for a knot in the table, for the um, knot 10, 1 to 5, uh, they do the job. So for example, for um, k 10, 1 to 5, we have uh, s is different from s3. So um, k is not squeezed. So this is the um, 2 minus 3, 5. Um, pretzel knot. Okay. All right. So I'm uploading the, the Dropbox here. Okay, so um, just as an illustration, let me tell you what the status is for um, knots with uh, low crossing number. That gives you a bit of an idea. So with crossing number 10 or less, we have 249 prime knots. So of the, the 249 prime knots, uh, with uh, crossing number 10 or less. So I'm ignoring symmetries here. Of those, all but six are squeezed. 243 are squeezed. So many of them are just alternating. Some of them are not alternating, but you can use um, different um, tools. 
Then there is, uh, well, there is 10, 1, 2, 5, which we already saw has S different from S3. There are three further knots which you can, um, whose non squeezedness you can show with a different tool, namely 942, uh, 10132, and uh, 10136. They have a non trivial steam rod square in Lipschitz, Zaka, Scovano commodity type. They have a steam rod square. And that's another obstruction from Covano homology. Um, also obstructs um, squeezedness. So K squeezed uh, implies that um, the Kovanov homotopy type uh, has no steel rod squares. And well, there remain two knots. Um, sorry, Lucas. Yes. I, uh, can you can you say can you remind us what a steam rod square is? Okay. Um, so uh, I won't give a complete definition, but here's roughly the idea. So Lipschitz Zaka um, reinterpret Kovano homology as the Okay, what I'm saying is not completely correct, but it's roughly the idea. So they re reinterpret it as the singular cohomology of a certain CW complex. Um, well, actually, it's a suspension spectrum, but let's not care about this. And of course, you could do this, you know, trivially, just blindly construct some CW complex that does that, but they don't do that. They do it uh, in, in a Sorry, meaningful so like, way. Um, yes. so there's a notion of steam rod squares in algebraic topology from like the 60s, I guess. It's, yeah. Um, so is that, is this similar to that? Yeah, it, it is that. I mean, uh, it is that. So the thing is they, they, they reconstruct Kovano homology, they reinterpret it as homology of cohomology of a space. And then you have cohomology operations on that space. And I think right. it's exactly those that are, you are second referring to. cohomology operation? Sorry? The Steenrad square? Is that yes. the second one? Um, so. Uh, Oh, okay. Right. All right. Well, never mind. Okay. I'll just I'll just brush up on my book. I, I'll go back to my algebraic topology books. So if I remember correctly, you get well, you get a sequence of steel rod squares, and um, I think you all you get them all in Kovano homology. I'm not sure which which ones are the ones that for which they actually have examples. So they are we have kind of reached the the limits of my knowledge by heart. But yeah, just. Uh, have a look at their paper, Lipschitz Zaka. And by the way, the proof that uh, squeezed knots have no steel knot squares is actually not so complicated. It's more or less the same proof as for as Lysthorus invariants. So, cobordisms give you um, uh, cobordism as they are functorial with uh, steel knot squares are functorial with respect to cobordisms. And then, if they are uh, and the torus knots don't have them. And if you squeeze a knot between torus knots, then just by degree considerations, you can have no steel rod squares in the middle. So it's not um, the proof of our theorem. There is not. Uh, um, it's not that hard once you have all that uh, hard work of the steel rod squares established. Okay, and yes, just okay. So there remain two knots where we can't. Uh, we don't know. We can't obstruct their squeezedness, and uh, we couldn't. Uh, we haven't succeeded in squeezing them manually. And um, let me see. So let me make one last remark, which is a bit tangential to this, um, but it's a fun remark. Um, and I want to close with that. So, all right, we have based most of this on Kronheim and Rovka's theorem that um, torus knots uh, have a slice genus equal to their three genus. And well, they proved this using gauge theory. And then this was um, another proof was given by Rasmussen using the S invariant. So this is a purely combinatorial proof. And okay, the S, oops, the 
S invariant is together with the tau invariant also the first example for the slice torus invariant. And the fun remark I want to I want to make is that actually the existence of slice torus invariants follows directly from Kronheimer and Morovka's theory. So here's the remark: you can prove that slice torus invariants exist just using Kronheimer and Morovka's theorem. So existence um, of let's say a slice torus invariant. Um, follows from um, Kronheim and Morovka's theorem is simply using the hahn banach theorem. So, of course, you have no idea how that slice torus invariant that you get there looks like, but abstractly you know they do exist. And I'll stop here. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any questions for, for Lucas? I mean, my question would be this last remark is slightly mysterious to me. Could you elaborate? Uh, yes. Okay, I can. Um, so what you do is you um, consider the concordance group tensored with R. That's an um, countable, countably dimensional real vector space. And then on that vector space, well, what you would like is that, you know, you have a, you have a, you have a metric there. Yep. Um, coming from D. And of course, what you would like is that that metric comes from a norm and the candidate is clearly G4. Um, but what you need to do is you need to um, stabilize this. Um, because, well, you have knots like the figure eight knot, uh, which have uh, G4 equal to zero, but which are non-trivial in the concordance group. So instead you consider uh, the stable slice genus G4 uh, hat, which is the limit n goes infinity of G4 of the n-fold sum of k divided by n. Mm -hmm. So this will be zero for knots like the figure eight knot. Or yeah. not that are torsion. Um, and conjecturally, this is actually a norm. Well, but we don't need that conjecture. What's sure is that it's a semi norm. Um, and well, then you use the little Han Banach machinery, which tells you if you have a, a, a linear functional, which is defined on a, on a subspace, and the subspace will be the space generated by torus knots. And on that space, we know what we want for a slice torus invariant. And on that space, it's dominated by a seminorm, which is here G4 hat. Then you can extend it to a um, linear uh, map on the whole space, which is still dominated by the seminorm. And if we do that, and then we restrict to C again, we will basically get a slice torus invariant. So that's, uh, that's the idea. And yeah, as I said, it's not, um, I guess it's not completely linked to the rest of the talk, but I found that this is a fun, a fun observation. And the motivation behind introducing this notion of squeeze knots is that uh, slice torus invariants are determined on them? Um, so the motivation is it's a bit, uh, um, we have these um, tools uh, coming from the link homologies, in, well, um, kovanov Rezansky. Uh, we have a number of tools and the motivation for squeeze knots is like to, to see exactly what those new smooth tools, you know, what they can exactly detect. Um, like to, uh, yeah, so, well, for example, um, 
we know that uh, quasi-positive uh, knots, actually strongly quasi-positive knots, they realize all ciphered forms. Actually, they, they even, so that's an old result by Rudolph, and then a more recent result by um, Feller and Borodzik is that they even realize all um, topological concordance classes combined with, with ciphered forms. So that means if you, if you look at, at squeezedness, you can do nothing with any topological, algebraic, or classical tools, just um, for example. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, well, if there are no further um, questions. Okay. Oh, okay. I actually have a question. Uh, okay, go then, Claudius. Uh, yeah, so what is known, or is anything known about the this subgroup of squeeze knots inside the borders group? So, like, I don't know, index or sort of finitely infinitely generated or something like that? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a. Uh, uh, that's a good question, of course. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, All torus nodes are squeezed, right? Yes. So I mean, it's certainly infinitely generated. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, the, the that's so. I mean, um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the uh, okay. Let me. Let's see it. So, um, yeah, and what, what I said earlier, so if you go, if you uh, um, go to topological concordance, then it's actually the, the whole group. Um, okay, and for the, okay, yeah, um, is that, did that make Simple any sense? So for topological concordance, right, so um, let me see if I can. So, um, all right, we have C, smooth. And then if I, uh, if I mod out topologically smooth knots, then I, sorry, topologically slice knots, then I go, is that right? Uh, I get this as a quotient. Uh, that looks right to me. And if you take the image of, let's call this, uh, maybe phi, if you take the image of squeezed, then you get the whole thing. Yeah, so I mean, this is um, maybe a bit more of the formal statement of what I was, uh, was saying earlier. Anyway, okay, and it's certainly infinitely generated. The, um, the index, I mean, I would suspect uh, it to be infinite, um, but I'm not sure we can say that quite yet. I, I think this is also work in progress. I mean, basically what you need to do is you need to, um, if you want infinite index, you need, um, well, you need an infinity of different obstructions uh, against squeeze net. And you should get this from, uh, from kovana brzezanski homologies, but um, so conjecturally, yes, but it's work in progress. But of course, that's exactly the kind of thing we are towards which we are uh, okay, thanks. working. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, well, let's uh, thank Lucas uh, virtually again and uh, hopefully see you all next week.